without any variance or hypocrisy. So in that mercy, O oh God, we sorely, sorely need that kind of wisdom. And we ask in faith, nothing doubting, knowing that you are more interested in helping us than we are in being helped. In Jesus' dear name, amen. by the gospel 
is God's plan of salvation. Did you hear that? For what the law could not do, because it was weak through the flesh, God could do and did do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering. I like that translation better. And condemned sin in the flesh. Now, the requirement of the law has been fulfilled in us. What we could not do through the flesh. Now, it might be interesting to find out what this verse does not say. It does not say we only have the law of Christ, we can keep it and he would receive us. But the law of Christ is the law of liberty, the uh, spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the same as the law of liberty or the law of Christ. And we need to recognize that. That doesn't say that some men are weak through the flesh, you know, not us, of course, because we're all strong in the flesh. We're all very strong, very determined, and very committed, very grand. No, we're not. It says what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Well, if you're in the flesh, brother, you're weak. You're unable to do this. You cannot do this yourself. This verse does not say, we appreciate your effort in sending your son, and we know he died to save us, but we have to work at it to make it effective. To make his salvation effective, now you might work at it to express your faith, of course you will, but dear friend, God doesn't do anything that needs your compliment. This verse does not say Jesus came for sin and coupled with our faithfulness, we are forgiven. Now, coupled with our faithfulness, we express our gratitude and happiness and joy and our confidence in what he did. This verse does not say that Jesus condemned sinning in the flesh. Did you hear that? It said something there to do then. This verse does not say Jesus condemned sinning in the flesh. It does say that it was in Christ's place or his human nature that God condemned and punished the sins of all people. It was in our place that he bore God's wrath on sin. And I've got a whole lot of references here, but I can't read those. Indeed, indeed, this is God's plan of salvation. For what the law could not do because it was weak through the flesh, God could do and did do by sending his own son the likeness of sin flesh and as a sin offering that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now we're going to get to the fourth verse. Justification by the gospel provides a demonstration of God's own purpose. What is his purpose? That the requirement, I like that much better than the word ordinance. That the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now we're just barely into this and it gets a whole lot more interesting from right here on. What are the requirements of the law? There are, are four of them. One, if, if you're going to obey the law, any law, any law, anyone, anytime has to, first of all, perfectly know the law. You have to have a perfect knowledge of the law of God. Number two, you have to perfectly obey all of God's law. Number three, you must accept the complete punishment or the full and final judgment of God on every transgression. And four, your grand, complete, perfect obedience has to be advertised so all men and all demons and all angels can see it. So I'm so glad that somebody did that. My dear Lord had a perfect knowledge of all of God's law. Absolute, total, omniscient knowledge of all God's laws. He perfectly obeyed God's laws in the most natural way that's so uh, unassuming. 
<laughs> that we really can't appreciate it, but he did. Number three, the complete punishment, that is the condemnation of every sin, of every man, was placed on him. He who knew no sin was made to be sin on our behalf. And then he was raised up between heaven and earth upon that instrument of torture so that all men and all angels and all demons for all time could see that the law was fulfilled in him. Now then, that's just the first half of the verse. That the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, God's purpose has been frustrated in many of us because we walk after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Well, what is he saying here? That uh, there is something in what we have just said that will move us, motivate us, and enable us to walk by the Spirit. It's our appreciation of what he did. It's our incredible gratitude, thankfulness, as well as love, that enables us to walk by the Spirit. Now this whole lesson is really an attempt to get you to be a real Christian. And I'm going to give you three motivations right out of the text here that will enable you motivate you to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. The first one we just said, that if we appreciate, if we just look with a, a, a casual glimpse at what God did in Christ, we'll be so eternally grateful that we'll never cease to thank Him. Number five. Justification gives us a new ambition, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Listen, I wrote this down so you would. Not only does a Christian escape condemnation, he also exemplifies in his own life and conduct the positive objective of righteousness. Exonerated from sin, emancipated from law, equipped by grace, he becomes a breathing embodiment of God's purpose. For this is the purpose of God, even your sanctification. Amen. Salvation wrought by the sacrifice of Christ was not engineered simply as an exhibition of God's power, although it was that. It was intended to lead to a blessed end. That is holiness. As Paul told the Galatians, if you live or are saved by the Spirit, by the Spirit also walk. The word live there has to do with spiritual life. If we do not set our mind upon the things that are above and not upon the things that are upon the earth, it is perfectly evident that we do not appreciate what it costs God and Christ and the Holy Spirit to give us justification. Justification is malfunctioned in us if we walk not by the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, what are the things of the flesh? As you know, there are only three. The lust of the flesh, which is sex and food. I mean, your flesh, your body, wants two things. Sex and food. Now, I know that two definitions of SARS, in this case, of, of the term flesh. But I'm talking to you about the practical nature of walking by the Spirit as versus walking by the flesh. And your flesh does strongly desire and must have food and sex. Number two, the lust of the eye is what you can buy. And uh, that's a little OB 
meaning definition, but it's nonetheless true. That the lust of the flesh is sex and food, the lust of the eyes, what you can buy. I mean, you see it, you want it, you see it, you want it, you buy it, and buy it, and buy it, and you're so in debt that you can't hardly get out. You have to work three jobs to pay for what you uh, have bought. Well, that's walking by the flesh. What is the pride of life? It's caving in the lifestyle of this world in speech, dress, and goals. That's the pride of life, which is far more uh, subtle, uh, far more uh, captivating temptation than the other two, far more pervasive. What are the things of the Spirit? Everything we know about the Holy Spirit or what He said is in His Word. Negatively, what He did not say about sex and food or the abundance of things that a man has or loving anyone or anything more than our Lord. Well, what is going to be the criteria for our conduct? Number six. Justification gives us a new condition, verse 6. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Holiness by faith in Jesus, not by effort of thine own. Sin's dominion crushed and broken by the power of grace alone. God's own holiness within thee, his own beauty on thy brow. This shall be thy pilgrim brightness. This thy blessed portion now. I've got these poems from various sources which say so poignantly what I want to say. What is it that keeps us choosing life instead of death? Is it a fear of hell? <laughs> That's a joke. We'll risk that danger. Just give us sex, food, and money, and we'll make it out. That's not going to deliver you to walk by the Spirit and walk not after the flesh. It is an awareness, listen to me, it is an awareness of our Savior's suffering that changes my mind and my life. What it costs him moves me to tears and willing obedience. I come to love him and then I obey him. Amen. Now the Bible tells us, and we've been arguing in our fellowship for a hundred years or more about singing. The Bible tells us how to do this, and so I'm going to. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior, bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my Yeah. 
in a minute. My wife and I went to a funeral here a couple weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. And on the way home, while she said, Honey, don't you think that uh, we ought to make arrangements for your uh, service? And I said, Well, I'm sure that we should, maybe for yours too. <laughs>
Such a person, that is a person, is the average person who walks by the place, whether it's you or someone else. Breaks rank and marches to his own tomb, and no one beginning with God is going to tell him what to do. He has no personal reason to love God, never really seen what Jesus did, who Jesus is, and what he accomplished on the cross. Besides that, he does not recognize God as authority. General Ford used to stand at attention before God every morning. I'm not going to go into the details of who General Ford was. At the beginning of each new day, he recognized the divine sovereignty of his king. This is exactly what you accomplish in personal worship. But you don't even take an hour or two hours a day in intimacy with worshiping God, worshiping Christ, allowing Him to speak to you. I feel so strongly about this that I think that Jesus did it. Of course, we don't need it, He did it. You know, that's why He got up a great while before day and went to a solitary place and prayed says so six times in the gospel because he needed to overcome the flesh. But more than that, he fundamentally needed to recognize the sovereignty, the majesty, and the authority of God. Paul did that. He had prayers. He said, always make mention of you in my prayers. And that's not just in his many times of praying, like without ceasing, but in the time and place. Now, all oh, how we need to renew this relationship constantly, every day. And in a period of time, if you don't give God quality time, you can't make any quality change. Let me mind the things of the flesh. We can do no other. We are just enslaved by stern moral, spiritual necessity. Here's we are, whom we serve. We have but one freedom, the freedom to choose who will be our master. I read recently of an astronomer that the number of stars and planets is like the grains of sand on the shores of the ocean. Sunday in your paper, the Columbus Dispatch, Sunday, April the 19th, our galaxy, the Milky Way, is made up of 100 billion stars. 100 billion. Now that's a number beyond the human comprehension. But that's just our galaxy and the Milky Way is a second rate galaxy compared to the other. How many galaxies are there? Several trillion. And if there's just 100 billion stars in several trillion galaxies, how many stars are there? Well, if you want to get a good idea, just go down to the seashore, get a handful of sand, come bring it back into your room, uh, sit down at the dining room table and pour it out. Then count the grains. Now, you know what a star is? It's nothing at all like this Earth. A star is considerably larger. Larger would not even be the word. Now you're going to tell the one who created that, that's Jesus, for without him was not anything made to happen. You're going to tell him what to do. I mean, uh, you might just stop expecting a tiny planet, tell the creator of these stars and planets what's right and wrong, and object to his disagreement with you. The authority of Christ 
as well as our love for Christ, as well as our gratitude for Christ, enables us to walk by the Spirit. But wait a minute, that's only two, three. The third one is found in verse 9, justification and the power of the Spirit. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. It's so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of him. The three motivations for walking by the Spirit are the cross of Christ, the authority of Christ, and the Spirit of Christ, or the Holy Spirit. Right in the text, it appears. Now, I got a real shocker when I did the research on this lesson. I've been conducting maybe 500, I just finished one yesterday, uh, Sonia. I've been conducting at least 500 seminars on the Holy Spirit. But I never really saw the word power and the word spirit so closely associated. Now, uh, I'm not going to delineate or exegete the verses I'm going to read. I'm simply going to point out to you that you have the power to walk by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. He returned in the power of the Spirit from Galilee. What is this word? For with the authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and Jesus cast them out by the Spirit of God. Behold, I'm giving you authority to tread upon the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. You've got more power than the enemy. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, I can tell you what uh, these words mean here, delineate the difference between much that is taught in the religious world today and what the plain text reads, but uh, that's not my purpose. Hey, friend, the power to walk with the Spirit is our love. Now, listen to me. I, I haven't been able to communicate this as well as I want to. I'm going to take another run at it. Do you have uh, an emotional identity with the Lord? I mean, is your gut level feeling moved when you think of the Lord? Are you in love with Jesus? I'm not talking about erotic love, I'm talking about love per se. Now, I, I cannot think of my wife without having an emotional identity with her because I love her. Our oldest son is in a most desperate condition right now in the Veterans Hospital, the psychiatric ward. And I could hardly think of his name without being emotionally moved because I love our son. Now, how about Jesus? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's in reading. Oh, yeah, he's the divine son of God. Well, does he touch you? Does he move you? Do you have a gut level feeling about Jesus? Well, I don't know. I'm not very emotional. What you mean is that he really doesn't affect you except when you're in church. That's sad, friend. That's worse than that. Then, number two, is authority. Now, we ought to tremble to even contemplate our flagrant disobedience to him. And it, it, it can't even get in our mind that we would say no to him. But most of all, what about the power of his spirit in us? By what power have you done this? Stephen, full of grace and power. God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. God gave us not a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-control. He put them all three there together. All that we can say with like a I am filled with power by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. 
we claim the, this power and work in us. Now, John 3.16 is a precious scripture, but Ephesians 3.16 is just as precious for us. Strengthened by his spirit, by his power in the inward man. Amen. But the only way that's ever going to happen is for you to practice the presence of Christ in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Number something nine. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That's verse 10. Justification gives us the invigoration of the spirit. Now, I thought that Paul said that we are in Christ. Here he says Christ is in us. But it's altogether common knowledge that we live by the atmosphere we live in. And by the atmosphere. We know to live in the atmosphere, but the atmosphere lives in us. The Holy Spirit in us is Christ in us. Our Lord has made our houses home. Now, I originally taught this, and I'm sorry for every time that I said it, which I don't think I was right at that time, that the Holy Spirit is a guest in our house. That's not right. He's the host. He's not the guest, he's the host. When Jesus walked with the two on the way to Emmaus, he got to the house and he said, this is the place where we're going to go, come on in, have dinner with us. He said, well, though, I think I better go on, I've got to go on earlier. He said, come on in. No, I can't do that. And they prevailed on him and he went in, but when he went in, he was the host. <laughs> I mean, he sat down at the table and he broke the bread. He sat out the table and he initiated the conversation. He led it. Now, friend, our blessed Lord and the person of the Holy Spirit moved into your house and he's no guest there that you tell him what to do. He's the host there and you're the guest. Go not my soul in search of him, I will not find him there or in the depths of the shadow dim, or on heights of upper air. For not in far off realms of space, the Spirit hath its throne. In every heart he finds a place, and waiteth there to be known. O oh, gift of gifts, O oh, grace of grace, that God should condescend to make my heart his dwelling place, and be his daily friend. Now, I went over to London and visited Buckingham Palace. They pointed out the flag that was flying, which means that the Queen is in residence. As I look over this audience, I see palaces much more impressive than Buckingham. And over each of these palaces, these sanctuaries, a uh, flag is lifted because the king is in residence. Really, is a king in residence in your house, in your sanctuary, in your palace? Death is a sentence passed upon all men as in that of all die. But the Spirit has given life, the Holy Spirit, to our human spirit, and an eternal existence, an eternal life. Now many times I've illustrated the fact that Jesus has taken up residence, permanent, personal residence. If he's a person and he lives in you, he lives in you personally because that's the only way a person could live in anybody. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, when you leave this uh, assembly and drive home, you pull into your driveway, you jump out of the car expectantly to go into a familiar surroundings and, and uh, 
you open your things just like you left. It might not be, but uh, you open things. You flip on the light and it's night, and there in the middle of your living room is a rocking chair, a very familiar rocking chair that you've had there for long years, but it's moving back and forth, and it's obvious there's somebody in it. And you're really kind of shocked, wondering how in the world did anybody get in here, who got in here, who's in that rocking chair. You're looking at the back of the rocking chair, and you move around to the side and see who it is, and you're soon aware that this person is surely different. He has on first century guard. He looks familiar and unfamiliar. And you get around to see who it is and say, who are you? He said, I'm the other Jesus. What? The other comforter. Oh, you are? Okay. He said, well, when did you get in here? Well, I came in here the same day you were baptized. You did? Yeah. I never saw you before. He said, you can say that again. <laughs> said, well, what? What have you been doing in here all this time? Well, so far, just rocking. Well, uh, what do you want me to hear? I mean, oh, oh, why didn't you come? Well, what do you want to do? said, anything we can agree on? said, well, since you're the king of kings and lord of lords, have all authority in, in heaven, the other world, this one too. I can see where the agreement will go. By the way, I came in here to see my program. Parts of it you probably won't like too good. Maybe all of it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the lifestyle of the world. Uh, of course, it's a good story though. I believe in getting rid of those cruds. <laughs> Called the adventure, you know, or something like that. But if you're just going to rock, I'll tell you what, a temperature doesn't bother you, does it? No, and he said, none of that other crap that comes over the booth do bother me either. I'm new. Did you hear that? Say something there. Say <laughs> Say, well, if, uh, if temperature doesn't bother you, well, we got a back room there. You can just get, yeah, we'll just move the chair out there and you can just stay in there and rock and all the uh, progress. <clears throat> we wouldn't do that to the Lord, would we? Well, we do it all the time. Jesus came to your house. Spend a day or two, he just walked up all unexpectedly. <laughs> I wonder what you did. Oh, you gave him the nicest room. Such like an honored guest. Food you serve to him, it sure be your very best. You just keep assuring him that you're all glad to have him there, that is, the visitor. <laughs> you're all glad to have him there, and serving him in your house is just joy beyond compare. But when you saw it coming, would you welcome him at the door? With your arms all outstretched and welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes for the summertime before you let him in and hide your magazines and put the Bible where they've been? <coughs> Listen, Frank, he's not going to take this kind of group. Amen. He's not going to put up with it. He doesn't buy it. He doesn't accept it. He rejects it. And he communicates that grief to your conscience. Right now, right here, and right with you. So, friends, the three divine motivations for walking by the Spirit and not the flesh, I'm not quite through yet, is the death of our Lord and our love for him for what he did. His divine position with all authority, King of kings and Lord of lords, absolute creator, ruler, owner of all things. And then his divine presence and power in the person of the Holy Spirit in our bodies. But if 
the spirit of him that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you. He that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead shall give life also to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwelleth in you. So then, brethren and sisters, we are debtors not to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we must die. But if by the spirit we put the death to the body, we'll have the new life. I want to read that verse again. The Spirit of Him that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead, the Holy Spirit got Jesus out of the grave. And that same divine person lives in our bodies. He who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead, you're going to the same place He went, the grave. Will give life also to your deathable body, the body that the worms eat, and give you a new body. And bring you out of the grave through his spirit who presently dwells in you. Now the last song that I will sing in my own funeral will be this one. 